Hey guys, Rob Skiba here. So I just got back from a really, truly wonderful conference in Beaumont, Texas. And I was uh, sharing the stage with Lex Meyer, Zach Bauer, and Steve Mutria. It was just a, an amazing conference. Uh, although we don't all agree, we certainly do not agree on a variety of non-essential topics. But still, uh, as you can see here, uh, we are all still very good friends. And um, I think it was a true example of how people can have civilized discussion uh, and still remain brothers. And uh, on my way back, I was looking for something to listen to. It was a long five-hour drive. And uh, I saw a video that was done recently by an individual named Pastor Dean Odell. Uh, he's one of a very few pastors willing to take a firm stand on what the Word of God has to say concerning our cosmology. And uh, I've, I've never spoken with him. I've never met him. I've seen one or two of his videos before. But uh, this one, the title alone just caught my eye. It was called The Dome, The Throne, and Skyfall Number 2. Wow. I'm going to put the link to the full video in the description below. But what I thought I would do is blend what he was saying with what I was saying this past weekend. He published his video on July 18th. I don't know if that's the day he actually did the video or if that's just the day he posted it. But... I did my presentation on July 22nd. So uh, just within a few days of each other, we were saying almost the exact same things with no coordination whatsoever. I've, I've never spoken with him. He's never spoken with me. Uh, and yet almost in stereo, we were saying practically the same thing. So what I thought I would do with this video is just sort of blend his video with my presentation and uh, let you guys see what the Word of God has to say concerning two very important things. First and foremost, the firmament, and secondly, the stars. And of course, all that has to do with what's over the circular, still flat earth set on pillars. But in my opinion, biblically speaking, there's simply no way around the language used for the firmament and the stars. So with that, I'm going to pick up with uh, my presentation shortly after I had my opening dialogue and was uh, calling people to pray about what they were about to hear. And uh, I would suggest that you do the same. Pray before you listen to this presentation. Pray while you're listening to this presentation. And then pray again after you listen to this presentation. And probably within the next day or two, I'll put the entire presentation that I did this past weekend on July 22nd. Uh, I'll put that up here on my YouTube channel and uh, as well as part two which I did the, the following day on uh, July 23rd. All right, so uh, here we go. I just would like to uh, start this off by asking you to say a silent prayer that God will reveal the truth to you, that Yahuwah will tell you what the truth is. Not Rob, not anybody. But yet, but that the Holy Spirit will teach you from the Scriptures. All right. So just take a second right now and ask for the Holy Spirit to teach you the truth in these matters. Thank you, Father. Um, you know the cool thing about that is if I'm wrong, then He's going to show me. All right. And if you're wrong, hopefully he'll show you a few things too. I got kind of trapped into these subjects because I grew up believing that this book is true. It is my only source for truth. It is my compass in a sea of lies. I got saved at an early age, grew up in a, in a Christian home. My dad was a Baptist minister when I was a kid. Vacation Bible school, any of you guys remember that? Yeah. Okay, finish, the, finish this lyric. The B-I-B-L-E. I. Stand up on the word of God. The B-I-B-L-E. All right. <laughs> yeah, all right. There we go. Well, I found that the vast majority of my detractors, while they say they believe the Bible, while they, they probably have studied it most of their life, 
when I have asked them to pray about the things that they are attacking me over, more times than not, I would say 90% of the time, they don't. They don't pray. Because they think it's absurd. Why would it? If I said, hey, guys, the sky is plaid. I'm telling you, the sky is plaid. Pray about it. Yet there's no reason to pray about it. That's ridiculous. It's absurd. Well, that's the, that's the same attitude that is applied to the topics we're going to talk about today. So I'm just going to say, please, pray about it. So let's just jump in here. Genesis, are we hearing what we want to hear or what was really said? I saw an interesting video on Facebook recently from a comedian, uh, and I'm just going to play a little clip from it because it's going to set the stage for the, <laughs> the rest of this presentation. When you're singing on a karaoke, you haven't got a clue that those were words. You know that song, We Are Family? For years I thought they were singing, Just Let Me Staple the Vicar. Right? <laughs> who's right and who's wrong here? Listen. All of the people around us they say, Can they be that close? Just let me staple the vicar. <laughs> That's what they sing. Just let me staple the vicar. What's all that about? Just let me staple the vicar. Apparently, according to Michael, your burgers are the best. I can hear you. They must have had one of them burger vans. You know they have that fun furs and doing steak Canadians and hot dogs. <laughs> Speaking of hot dogs. Near, far, you are. I believe the hot dogs go on. Got a bit of rivalry here, Michael. <laughs> Celine's peddling hot dogs. Celine's peddling hot dogs. <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, you, and you're laughing because you know you sung lyrics, and you know you find out later that they're wrong. Um, I'm going to submit that there's some things in Scripture that we're doing the same thing with. Because some people have put pictures or images in our mind and we're interpreting it based on those images, just like he did. He showed you a staple and a vicar and then played the song and made you, he, and as soon as you saw the picture, now all of a sudden that's all you can hear. Somebody stapled a vicar. Uh, I'm going to suggest to you that this is the greatest image of all time that's been planted into our minds. And I'm going to give justification for why I said that. Creation, according to Genesis, let's just go right through it. All right. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. How are we doing so far? Good? Okay. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. There's a documentary out there that I actually highly recommend. I'm going to sort of pick on it throughout this presentation, but don't get me wrong. I think it is actually a fantastic presentation. It's called Is Genesis History? I don't know if you've seen it before. Uh, it's on Netflix. Uh, probably elsewhere as well. It's really, really good. Uh, but I've got a few clips that I've taken from that documentary that I want you to pay attention to. And we'll start with this one right here. You're talking about the origin of literally everything. And I think if we zoom out from that and say, well, what really is the difference between these two paradigms? It isn't a question of science on the one hand versus religion on the other, because both of them are scientific in the sense of looking at a common body of data. Really at the deepest level, the difference is two competing views of history. What is the true history of our cosmos? That does seem to be the real question. What is our true history? What actually happened? The conflict is not between two views of science, but between two competing views of history. Since Genesis was written in Hebrew, I wanted to talk to a Hebrew expert. What was actually in the original text? The first word 
in Genesis is Breshit. Breshit, Genesis 1 1 is Breshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve'aretz. So this is the beginning of the Toledot of, uh, of Noah. Interesting that that word Toledot is a very interesting word. It's translated sometimes genealogy, sometimes it's translated history. And what follows then is the account of the flood. Mm -hmm. Steve, it seems that there is a lot of history in the Bible. Is that how you see it? Is Oh, absolutely. In fact, the first thing is that it's an accurate historical account. Mm -hmm. the, the presentation is such, uh, and the perspective of the writers, that they believe they were talking about real events. Okay. It's, very, it's very obvious that because of the way in which uh, they in, insist that the next generation learn, you know, learn mm -hmm. their history. When you look at these early chapters in Genesis, what do you see? Can you take us through this? It starts with, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. There's, there's no word in Hebrew for universe. That means he created everything. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing we find in Genesis 1-2, we find a water ball that is in space. Mm -hmm. God, in the subsequent days, is going to fill that universe. Just let me staple the vicar. You see a water ball there. Do you see a water ball there? No, there's no word in Hebrew for universe either. But yet his, this is a historical document. That's what he's saying. He's a Hebraist. He's an authority. This is what the filmmakers went to to, to, to say, okay, how should we view Genesis? And he makes that point throughout the, his segment of the video. is saying this is a historical narrative. It's not written as poetry. It's not written allegorical. It's written as history to be passed on. We're supposed to read the Torah every year, right? And if you're a king, you're supposed to write it out. You're supposed to know your history. Do you see a ball floating in space in a universe here? I don't either. Celine's peddling hot dogs. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Interesting. How do we typically believe that light in, for a day uh, comes to us? By the sun. Yet, we've got day and night, three days before the sun shows up. The sun's just there to govern it. God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. How many firmaments are there? Open book test. Okay, let's continue. Well, you're talking about days here. Do you see these as literal days? Is that what the text is telling us? Or you know what other people think, that the, this is just a poetic, uh, different Well, first of, of all, it's, it's not poetry. The world's greatest Hebraists all affirm that this is a narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they, they say that that's one of the unique features uh, of the Genesis accounts of creation and the flood is that they are narratives because in the ancient Near East they are done in epic poetry, which is very different. And here we have narrative to indicate that this is historical. What that means is that the, you should understand the words, the, the normal way in which those Hebrew words are understood. The word yom, it means day. Uh, the foundation of its usage is what we mean by a day. It's a 24-hour day. The only way you'd want it to mean a lo longer period of time is if, is if you impose an alien uh, concept to the text mm -hmm. and say, well, I think that, that these are ages, and therefore Yom has to mean ages. What you have to do is start with the text. Yeah. If we start with the text, Yom means day. So when we come to uh, the passage that talks about uh, the creation of, of Adam and mm -hmm. Eve, yeah. Um, you're seeing that as a clear historical event which would stand in direct opposition to the conventional paradigm that, that man evolved out of a long, long process. The biblical text is not compatible with the standard, mm -hmm. uh, the conventional paradigm. It is not compatible with the standard conventional paradigm. Now, he's making that reference in regard to the evolution of man. But in the context of everything else he's saying, I would say that that's the entire case, that the, the standard cosmological worldview that we have is simply not compatible with the Genesis narrative, which he said, again, is not poetry. It is historical fact. 
That's the way it's written. So what about the firmament? The word is rakia, Strong's number 7549. It's an extended surface, solid, as if, as if beaten out. It's a base. It's a support base. It, uh, it supports the waters above. Uh, a lot of people out there want to say, well, but isn't it just an expanse? It's just the expanse. It's just air, gas, atmosphere, the vacuum of space. Well, uh, it doesn't say that in Hebrew, and it doesn't say it in Greek either. When you look at the Greek Septuagint, which was written by Hebrew scholars, some say 70, that's why we have the, the, the name Septuagint, that 70 Hebrew scholars took their Hebrew text in the Hebrew con uh, context and historical framework that they understood to be true. They took the word rakia in Hebrew and translated it into Greek as stereoma, if I'm pronouncing that right, which is a com combining form borrowed from Greek where it meant solid, used with reference to hardness, solidity, three-dimensionality, and the formation of compound words. If you look up resources like this uh, from Blue Letter Bible, it, it says it's an extended surface, solid, expanse, firmament, expanse, flat as base support, firmament, a vault of heaven supporting the waters above, considered by Hebrews as solid and supporting waters above. comes from another word, uh, the uh, root word, uh, 55, excuse me, 7554, if you look at that word right there, that word means to beat out, to stamp out, to spread out, as if you're taking sheets of metal and spreading it out. How do you beat out air? How do you beat out the vacuum of space? How do you beat out gases? This is talking about beating out, spreading out, as if spreading out metal. And we have scriptures like here, Job 37, and I've got a variety of translations there for you, talking about the sky being hard as molten looking glass. King James said it spread out, spread out the sky, again, beaten out, which is strong as a molten looking glass. What is a molten looking glass? Well, we would say it's a mirror, but a mirror in those days was a sheet of metal that was beaten out and polished to the point where you could see a reflection in it. That's what, these, that's what the scripture says. Uh, we also see that it's the location of, of Yahuwah's throne is above the firmament in Ezekiel chapter 1. In Isaiah, it says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. We see in Amos 9, 6, which is an extremely interesting verse to study. Uh, I chose the New American Standard Bible because it appears to have the most accurate translation when looking at the words used there. The one who builds his upper chambers in the heavens and has founded his vaulted dome over the earth. The word there is aguda, which is a structure fitted together. King James says troop. He has founded his troop on the earth. And that's a little vague. What is that? A troop? Well, uh, I was in the army. I was in sea troop first and one tenth air cap. Ooh, ah. Sorry, it's a reflex. Uh, it, it's called the troop because it's a band of, of people gathered, that are together and unified for a purpose. It, the, the, the word has to do with binding together. Uh, if you look up, up that word, Strong's number 92, a vaulted dome, vault of heaven fitted together. It is attached to the earth. That's why a lot of times whenever you see the earth shaken, heaven's shaking too. The powers of heaven are shaken and the earth is having an earthquake. Why? Because they're connected. The two are connected. Well, there's also this idea that there's this vault of heaven. This is taken from Amos 9, 6. And he has founded his vaulted dome over the earth. This is one of the proof texts that a flat earther will bring to you. They'll say, well, see, it says right there. So do you believe God's word or don't you? And now you're with, well, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I mean gosh, what, what am I to do? Well, is this really proof of a domed earth? The root appears four times in Scripture. We find it Exodus 12, 22, and you shall take a bunch. The word here in Hebrew is agudat, okay, agudat. You shall take a bunch, which comes from the word aguda, or eged, which means together, something that's, that's a collective. All right, you can take the eged bus in Israel today because uh, it's a collective, kind of like a, the idea of a bus, right? It's, it's all together. Uh, here is a bunch of hyssop dipping in the blood. 2 Samuel 2.25, the children of Benjamin gathered together and became a unit. La Aguda. Okay, so there it is again. Isaiah 58.6, to undo the heavy burdens, Agudot. And then Amos 9.6 is the, the, you know, the fourth out of the four. And hath founded his troop. This is a different translation. The King James of all people, all right, comes up with this. And hath founded his troop, which is Va'agudot. 
dato in the earth and he that calleth forth the waters of the sea so just because you find it in the new american standard bible you don't find it in the king james and the hebrew doesn't demand that not by any any stretch of the imagination so how they got that i have no idea um again i don't know where they came up with this idea of the vaulted dome but that's not what the word actually means and if you look at it the four times that it appears it has the idea of a troop that's something that's that's bunched together a unit so it doesn't mean that it's a vaulted dome so what's happening is people are making their flat earth claims based on their limited understanding of english this is why we have to go back to the hebrew and say what does the hebrew really mean and you don't just simply go back to strong's lexicon you go back to scripture you say where is the word used how is it used right take this for example vaulted dome let's say that's the the interpretation let's fit it into these other contexts does it really work and you shall take a vaulted dome of hyssop and dip it in the blood and the children of Benjamin gathered together and became a vaulted dome uh, to undo the vaulted domes. I mean, really, is that what the word really means? You see, that's all you have to do. It's that simple. It's really that simple. You say, does this word mean that? And if it fits the other context, then it, that's probably what it means. But if it doesn't, if you have this thing called a vaulted dome, and here it doesn't fit any of the other contexts, and it's the same exact word, then it's not what it means. So again, vaulted dome is not a real interpretation it's not a authoritative interpretation we cannot use it in support of the flat earth theory amos 9 6 is a very interesting passage of scripture and the king james says he founds his troop on the earth don't really know what that means new international version however says that he builds his lofty place in the heavens and sets its foundation on the earth new living translation says that the Lord's home reaches up to the heavens while its foundation is on the earth. The English Standard Version says, who builds his upper chambers in the heavens and founds his vault upon the earth. The New American Standard Bible is the most interesting one to me. It says, the one who builds his upper chambers in the heavens and has founded his vaulted dome over the earth. Of course, King James talks about founded his troop on the earth. Holman Christian Standard Bible says he builds his upper chambers in the heavens and lays the foundation of his vault on the earth. International Standard Version says, who builds his stairway to heaven and setting its foundation on earth. The Net Bible says he builds his upper rooms of his palace in heaven and sets its foundation supports on the earth. And the New Heart English Bible says he builds his chambers in the heavens and has founded his vault on the earth. God's Word translation says stares up to heaven and sets its foundation on the earth. And the JPS Tanakh 1917 says uh, he builds his upper chambers in the heaven and has founded his vault upon the earth. So what's going on with all that? Well, we talked a little bit about that in the interview I did with Zen Garcia, so I'll just play that for you here. Very interesting discussion concerning Amos 9.6. Let's talk some more about the vaulted dome. You mentioned um, I love Biblehub.com also, and mm -hmm. earlier you talked about Amos 9.6, which is if you're a King James only guy, you, you completely miss it. Uh, King James says, "It is he that buildeth his stories in the heaven, and hath founded his troop in the earth." You're like, what? But like right. all the other translations, pretty much talk about this vault uh, that's set upon the earth. And the New American Standard is the one that just comes right out and calls it a vaulted dome. But many of the other ones use the word vault also. Um, and although the King James 2000, kind of a newer, updated version of the King James, uh, also uses vault. So wh what did you find? Uh, why did the King James use troop? Did you look into that at all? Or Well, when you look up the word aguda, which is the Hebrew word which um, they use, well, the King James translates that as troop. It, it, it actually speaks about binding um, like in a group of men, which is why they used the King James translated as troop, or binding the, in this case, the firmament to the earth, oh. which makes a lot more sense. Because if you read the first portion of the chapter uh, or the passage, it says the one who builds his upper chambers in the heavens. So it's actually speaking about first where the Most High God sits upon the dome of the earth and where the heavenly temple is created and in my mind and I explain this in great detail in this particular chapter that when you look at the context of the passage it should be 
translated as the vaulted dome, which binds the earth to the firmament. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, because right in the King James, it's he that buildeth his stories in the heavens. So you got th- this idea of stories or levels being built in heaven, but founded his troop, his, his uh, was it Aguda? Yes, Aguda. Uh, being uh, like bound together, attached, as it were, to the earth. Right. Ah, that's awesome. Which, uh, if you look at the word Aguda, uh, the definitions are band, binding, cords, bands, thongs, slavery, bunch of hyssop, a band of men or troops, and the fourth one, vault of the heavens or firmament, as in binding the earth to the heavens. Wow, that is awesome. There's another individual out there who is considered to be a Semitic language expert by the name of Dr. Michael Heiser. Now, let me say this as clearly as I can. Michael Heiser is not a flat earther. Did you hear me? So all you psychos out there that want a soundbite that are going to try to use it against me and try to get him against me, as people have already done, I have never said, nor have I ever implied, that he is a flat earther. I am simply using his research to show you that he came to the exact same conclusion I did because people think I'm the village idiot. Fine, okay, I'm a village idiot, but here's a guy with letters after his name that's considered a Semitic language expert that everybody runs to. Ah, Schema says this, what do you think? He says the exact same thing I've been saying. And if you don't believe me, let's listen to him. So let's take a look at the parts. Waters above and below the heavens. Genesis 1.6, God said, let there be an expanse. Some translations have firmament. It's rakiah in Hebrew. In the midst of the waters. And let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse, the rakiah, and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And what was that expanse called? Heaven. The heavens, the sky, Shemayim in Hebrew. So you have here the sky, okay, and you have waters above the sky, and of course you've got waters below down here, but then you have you know, the atmospheric heavens as well. Psalm 148 mentions the waters that are above the heavens. That's after the flood. Did you catch that? Because a lot of people want to say, oh, the water's above. They went away with the flood. See, the, 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 the firmament was this canopy thing, and it was there, and then the flood, it just went away. And... No, it wasn't. According to the psalmist, it's, he's still referring to it. Proverbs 8, when he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep. Isn't that interesting? We'll get to that circle on the face of the deep. When he made firm the skies above. Made firm is amatz in Hebrew. It is the same verb for letting a tree grow firm, hard. Ancient cosmology across the board believed that the sky was this dome over the earth and it was solid. Kind of like the Truman Show. Okay. They believed that the stars were affixed to it. Some of the stars never moved, but other ones did. And the ones that did, this is why the word stars is attributed to the sons of God and to angels in biblical literature. They believed that the stars were animate beings, that they were really divine beings, and then they'd come to earth as angels, but they, were, they lived up there. And those were the ones that moved. Why? Because movement shows what? If something moves, it's alive, okay? Again, they can't take a rocket and go up and check it out. They, they believe that this is, they're, they're, there's a solid expanse over them. Another passage, Job 37, verse 18. Can you, like him, you know, speaking of Job, you know, drawing the dramatically poor comparison of God and Job, of course, we know who's going to win there, but... Can you, like him, spread out the skies hard, kazakh, hard as cast metal, mutsak, as a metal mirror? Mutsak is the same word used in the casting of the laver, you know, the tabernacle where they would wash. It's 
solid. It's also the same terminology used for flint rock. Again, these passages point to the belief that there's a dome, the sky's a dome, and it's solid. And God lives above it. We live below it. All right. Semitic language expert, letters after his name, one of the uh, scholars on the staff at Logos Bible Software, saying the same exact thing that I've been saying. In fact, if you go through the ancient record and just pick a culture, pick a culture, look through their writings, and you're going to see the same cosmology depicted in the Sumerians and the Egyptians and the Greeks. If you look at uh, the, the Mayan, the Incan, the Navajo cosmology, same thing. If you look in Norse or Irish mythology, same thing. It's all over the place, everywhere you look. Some want to ignore all of these facts and try to dismiss the biblical historical understanding of the firmament, arguing rather that it's just the expanse of air and gas. For instance, uh, they'll also come up with uh, ideas of uh, multiple firmaments. All right, so the expanse in the midst of the waters, that's the rakia. It's not a solid dome like the flat earthers want you to believe, or even good scholars like Dr. Michael Heiser and others who would say that this is a dome. Uh, I just happen to disagree with him. Oh, well, the earth's flat and it has this dome above it called the firmament, this ice dome or water dome or whatever. But this is false. When the Bible says, let there be a firmament, in the midst of the waters that divides the waters from the waters and dividing the waters under the firmament from the waters above the firmament. This is simply dividing the water that's on this earth, the water that you know is in the seas and the lakes and the rivers, referring to that being separated from the water that is in the atmosphere. You know, when we have clouds above us, that's water up there, okay? That's moisture up there, that's H2O. So the waters above the firmament are the waters that are up in the atmosphere in the form of clouds. That's all. The firmament is called heaven. Well, what does the Bible define heaven as? The sky. Okay. Now, there are multiple heavens. The Bible talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the, being caught up to the third heaven. You know, because there's the heaven as in the sky. There's the heaven as in, you know, uh, uh, space in a sense with the stars and the moon and the sun in it. That's also called heaven. And then there's heaven, the place where God lives. That's why it's called the third heaven, because there are three heavens, okay? So there are also three firmaments, okay? There's the firmament in the sense of the sky, in the sense of outer space, and in the sense of where God lives, okay? So people just don't understand the word firmament because it's a word that we don't use in our modern vernacular whatsoever. But it's these, basically it's these layers as you go outward is, is what the firmament is. So you have a, a layer of water where you're underwater, then you have a layer of atmosphere, and then you have water that's in the atmosphere, then you have another layer of outer space, and then you have where God lives. So again, this thing of the firmament being an ice dome, the, the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible just says there are waters above the firmament. Oh, wow, it's, it's talking about clouds in the sky. Oven theory would be the first heaven is the atmosphere that we're breathing up, maybe it used to be maybe 10 miles thick, and now it's expanded out to 50 or 60 miles. Who cares? It used to have a atmosphere, <clears throat> I'm gonna pick a number and say 10 miles thick, a layer of ice, maybe three fingers thick like Josephus and the Jews taught, uh, you know, have always taught. Then stars with bazillions of stars in it going who knows how far, and then another crystalline firmament. And beyond that, I don't know. Uh, but Paul was caught up to the third heaven. Lack of understanding the three level heavens is what leads the flat earthers belief that of what would seem very logical, actually, if, if there was only one heaven with one firmament. So, in their defense, it may not seem so outrageous as most of us might think. True Bible cosmology, however, tells us that there are three different realms with three different firmaments separating them from one another. So the first heaven would be where the birds fly, the second heaven where the stars are, and the third heaven where God lives. And God said, let there be a firmament, a firmament, a firmament, a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, the firmament, the firmament, the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. Need I say more? <laughs> yeah. Alexander Scorby, rapping for us. <laughs> This was the ancient view, the ancient Hebrew cosmology, but also shared by 
pretty much everybody else as well. Have you ever played the game or heard the game whisper down the lane? Right? Where you tell, you know, one person starts off saying something, and by the time it gets to the end, it's changed. Right? Who is most likely to have the truth? The one closest to the original source information or the one farthest away? Closest. Absolutely. And when you go back to those who are closest, uh, you know, it's only because of evolutionary thinking that we believe the further back we go, the dumber they are. Let's put it in perspective. We're so smart we think we came from monkeys today, right? That, it, as Ken Hovind would say, evolved from goo to you by way of the zoo. And that that life itself evolved out of rock, all right, that's how advanced we are today. No, it's the other way around, you know. The further back we go, the more advanced they were. And yet, this was the view that they had and regularly wrote about. And these are scripture references for that cosmological worldview and this meme somebody did. We also have other descriptions like this, a tent over the earth. And God called the firmament, the firmament, the firmament, the rakia, the beaten down metallic structure, heaven, or shamaim, in Genesis 1.8. And Isaiah says, Have you not known, have you not heard, hath it not been told to you from the beginning, i.e. Genesis? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretches out the heavens, the shamaim, as a curtain, and spread them out, as a tent to dwell in. Now we have the word as being used there. It's not there for the word circle, but for the tent, it's there because he's drawing, he's making a metaphor for you to think about. The heavens are stretched out over us like or as a tent. So we have a metaphor there. Well, in Isaiah's time, this would be a tent. If he's using a metaphor, people who are hearing his words would associate the metaphor. Okay, tent. It's a structure spread out over a flat surface, a tent. Modern times, something like this maybe. Uh, how many of you have heard of Andrew Hoy? A few of you? If you haven't, you might want to check him out. Independent of my research, completely independent of my research, he has been spending time in Israel. He's a structural engineer and a Hebrew scholar, spending time in Israel studying the tabernacle in the wilderness. And how many of you know the Torah says don't add to it and do not subtract from it? You know that? Strict warning, right? Well, he's looking at the typical models of the tabernacle in the wilderness that you see. And you can see a lot of them in various places in Israel. People have models set up and stuff like that. And he's looking at the itemized shopping list that Moses has given. Moses was given a blueprint, wasn't he? To emulate on earth something that he saw in the heavenlies. And he has, was given a, an itemized list to present to Bezalel and his partner, right, to go make this thing. Do not add to it. Do not subtract from it, especially if it's this important. And he's looking at all of these tabernacle models, and they all have added ropes of different sorts, of pegs, beams, to support this rectangular box structure that they've created. And he's going, well, they have to do that because that's the least structurally sound thing you could build would be a box. It could fall all kinds of different ways. So they have to stabilize it with all this other added material. But that's material that's not given in the list. So he was just trying to be a biblical literalist, and he's going, oh, something's wrong here. And he said, well, why, why, why do people come up with this shape to begin with? Because we're not given a shape in the instructions for the building of the tabernacle. But we are giving a lot, given a lot of detail, actually, to the curtains. And he's like, why is so much detail given to the curtains? And it says, connect the curtains at the ends. Well, everybody assumes you connect them at the long ends because they're re long rectangular strips. He says, but that's an assumption. And if you make that assumption, you end up with a rectangular box. But the text doesn't demand that you make that assumption. So he said, well, what if I connect them at the short ends? And when he did, this was the model that he came up with, with no added material for it. Completely independent of my work. Flat Earth was the furthest thing from his mind. Meanwhile, of course, I had created my model, and he was looking for, he thought his model uh, justified pi. And so he thought this was perfect proof of the globe. So he was looking for pictures of the globe that were royalty-free that he could use in his literature to help promote what he was trying to do. 
and he found the same problems that I had when I start looking into the globe earth pictures. You start seeing words like composite and CGI, and they tell you right up front, this is not a real photograph. And he's like, what? And in the course of going down that rabbit trail, he found my diagram, and he said, I got to talk to this guy. So he contacts me, and now this on my side, that's his side. On my side of things, I'm taking heat like you wouldn't believe. People coming at me from every direction. Christians have the only military that assembles its firing squad in a circle. And I was right in the middle of it. I wasn't even touching the ground. I was floating in the air. And was like, I'm, I'm done. I mean, just for, this is it's not worth it. And I, I get this phone call from a guy who's a mutual friend of Andy's. And, and, I, and he said, did you get this package from a guy named Andy Hoy? And I said, I don't know. I get a lot of mail, and I don't, I don't always have a chance to, to look at it, especially if it's thick. I mean, if I get a package that's full of literature, I'm like, oh, jeez, <laughs> I just don't have time to look at it. He says, it's, it would be worth it for you to look at it. And so I'm all right. So I go home. I went and found it, opened it up, read the cover letter, see that picture. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> um, I could spend a lot of time talking about this, but we got to move on. So if you're interested in his model and, and what he's done, the website is project314.org. Highly recommend you check it out. Okay, so that's the beginning of my presentation. It sort of sets the stage for the rest of this video. And now we'll transition to Pastor Dean Odell's message, The Dome, The Throne, and Skyfall Number 2, with some inserts from my presentation that I'll throw in here and there just to complement what he has to say. Again, I'll put the link to his uncut presentation in the description below. And we're going to pick up with his, uh, where he starts talking about uh, how we should study the Bible with correct biblical hermeneutics. Slide four, we get law number one of biblical hermeneutics, and I'm going to go through them real quickly. It says, the most important law of biblical hermeneutics or interpreting the Bible is that the Bible should be interpreted literally. Now, that's your number one rule. And again, I've checked this with my friend, Dr. John, who was the uh, dean of graduate students for a university, a seminary. Uh, he got his PhD from Fuller Theological Seminary. He's, uh, he reads the Bible in Hebrew and Greek. And I asked him, I said, is this the true definition that a conservative seminary would say is the true definition of biblical hermeneutics or interpretation? And he said, absolutely. Uh, so the first rule is that we must uh, interpret the Bible literally. And he said, we are to understand the Bible in its normal or plain meaning unless the passage is obviously intended to be symbolic or if figures of speech are employed. The Bible says what it means and means what it says. Now, I want to say this, that uh, even at times when the Bible uses symbolic language, for instance, I've shared this about the beast with seven heads and ten horns. It's sharing their symbolic language but it is, even the symbolic language is about something literal, the coming world government that will have seven heads and ten horns or ten kings. So even symbolic language is meant to identify or illustrate or, or lead us to finally figure out that there is something literal that God's talking about. Uh, the second law of biblical interpretation, i.e. hermeneutics, is... Uh, the, that passages must be interpreted historically, meaning how they were understood in history and in the time they were written. And grammatically, we must look at the Hebrew and the Greek and, the, and how the, the sentences and the words and the verbs and all these things are constructed. And we must look at the context more than anything else. Okay? So that's your second law of biblical hermeneutics. Your third law is uh, what you guys have heard me say many, many, many times over and over. The third law of biblical is always the best interpreter of Scripture, or as I have said it many times, let the Bible interpret the Bible. You don't get to put your own spin on it, on what it says. That's why, see, there's, there's too many people out there right now say, well, well, I've got my interpretation. And, you know, you have your interpretation and I have my interpretation. No, I'm friend, I'm sorry. There are some things that we might can go, we, maybe we don't understand and we have different views on, but when it comes down to following the laws of biblical interpretation about what something means 
or what a passage is talking about. You don't get to decide arbitrarily what it means. That's why we have so much confusion in the body of Christ, and that's why we have so many different denominations. It's because we can't follow simple rules, the basic simple rules of interpreting Scripture and what it's talking about. Now, as I've said before, there's no interpretation to many Scriptures. Thou shalt not commit adultery is pretty plain, isn't it? We don't need any interpretation to that. You don't do it. Adulterers will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's pretty plain, isn't it? I mean, there's a lot of stuff we don't need any interpretation of. Um, but I want to show you this because I've had some people recently, some Christians, and I mean some good Christians, well-meaning, love God. I'm not questioning their, their salvation or, the, or, or where they stand with God. But, of course, when you get into this stuff where you've been brainwashed all your life in secular Copernican cosmology and all these other things, um, you know, you begin to wonder, you know, and the church, most of the church bought into it, and what the church tried to do is meld the two together and try to make Scripture work with the world's view of creation and, and what science says, and it just, it, it's a mess. Um, but I had a Christian kind of argue and say, well, do theologians, what other theologians would agree with you or believe this? Now, let me explain something. I'm going to show you. There's a, there's a number of theologians across the world and over time that have plainly said that the Bible teaches that the earth is a flat plane with an above and a below covered by a solid molten glass-like crystalline dome. And that is the way it is. Now, I just, I pulled this up right here. This is... Uh, this is some of those scholars talking about it right here. And, and this is, uh, it lists three of them right here, but this is what they said. The, the biblical authors pictured the earth as a flat disk floating in water with the heavens above and the underworld below. The rakia or the firmament was a solid inverted bowl above the earth colored blue by the cosmic ocean that is above it that kept the waters above from flooding the world. Now, this is, this is scholars David E. Uh, Ayun, Terence E. Fretham. I mean, these are guys, Westminster Dictionary of New Testament and Early Christian Literature. Again, this is not Pastor Dean. This is, if we're going to go with what the Bible teaches, you have to understand that these theologians agree that the Bible teaches that the earth is a flat disk floating in water. There's nowhere in the scriptures, not one place, that the Bible teaches that the earth is a ball flying through space. The word circle and the word ball are both used in the book of Isaiah, and they're two different Hebrew words. And when it says, and we're going to go through that verse in a minute, when it says God sits upon the circle of the earth, it is not the word ball. So if you want to be biblical and you want to say we live on a ball, you want to say God made a ball that's dangling in space and flying around the sun, well, then you're going strictly on your own interpretation because the Bible does not teach that. Not one place, never has it, never will it. In fact, there's many, many verses that say the earth is stationary, immovable, fixed. It doesn't move, doesn't spin, doesn't orbit. And there's many verses that tell us it's the sun and the moon and the stars that move in a circuit over us. And is that not what we observe? when we walk outside, right? I don't know, I mean, there's not many people. Anybody, anybody in here ever been in an earthquake? I have. I lived in California. I, I, was, I was about eight years old climbing a tree and it nearly shook me right out of the tree, all right? But other than that, I've never felt the earth move, have you? <laughs> I don't feel any spin, I don't sense any motion. And do you know that every experiment that's tried to find and prove the motion of the earth has failed? There's been no scientific experiments ever to prove that the earth is moving. The earth is not moving. The sun, moon, and stars are moving. And this is what the Bible teaches. I've given it to you before, but Psalm 19 talks about the sun being like a, a, a man that runs his race. And he runs in a circuit from one end of the heaven to the other. The sun moves in a circuit over us. Joshua told the sun and the moon to stand still in Joshua 10. It's also recorded in the book of Jasher. 
He told the sun and the moon to stand still, and guess what? They did. I'm telling you, again, are we going to be biblical Christians? Are we going to be worldly Christians? Are we going to try to mix the world into this? So I want you to see this, and this is for my, my dear sister out there that tried to tell me that you know theologians in, back in the day used to believe that the earth was a ball. No, the biblical authors, everybody get that in your head. Let me read this to you again. The biblical authors pictured the earth as a flat disk floating in water with the heavens above and the underworld below. The rakia, which is the Hebrew word for firmament, was a solid inverted bowl above the earth, colored blue by the cosmic ocean, the waters above, that kept the, and it kept the waters above from flooding the earth below. We know that God, in the book of Genesis, when he did flood the world, it says what? He opened the windows of the heaven. And I'm going to show you there's three heavens. I'll show you what those are in just a second. But notice he says, from about 300 B.C., a newer Greek model largely replaced the idea of the three-tiered cosmos. So who came in and began to change things? The pagan Greeks came in and began to change what the Hebrew prophets of the Bible had taught humanity. So the, Greek, the pagan Greeks come in and began to teach a newer view. They saw the earth as a sphere at the center of the set of seven uh, concentric heavens, each one visible, uh, one each for each visible planet, and thus, and then the sun and the moon, and with the realm of God in the eighth or highest heaven. So the Greeks came up with, no, we're on a ball, but we are the center. They still kept us at the center, and then they had these seven layers, but they just, again, they're just making up crap, right? This is just the Greeks' theory here. Um, but anyway, it says that, but although several Jewish works from this period have multiple heavens, as do some New Testament works, none has exactly the formal Greek system. So it, anyway, this is what we get. Now, here again, here's just so you see that it's not just uh, a Wikipedia article. I went and found the books of these people. This is the Westminster Dictionary of New Testament Early Christian Literature. As you can see in here, he tells you about the cosmology. In addition to these rational and naturalistic cosmologies, there were two major mythological cosmologies in the ancient world. Uh, the archaic cosmology conceived the world in terms of a three-tiered cosmos consisting of the earth as a flat disk in the middle, surrounded by the river ocean uh, or floating on water, and then the heaven above and the underworld beneath. Um, of course, it, he goes on to talk about the cosmology of the three heavens was reflected by the Apostle Paul when he said he ascended to the third heaven. Um, that's one of them. Here's another, just so you see it. This is, not just, this is not just Pastor Dean's opinion. Theologians, including Dr. Michael Heiser of Logo Software, admits that this is what the ancient Hebrews, the prophets, Moses, Joshua, this is what they taught. And this is what they believed for thousands of years. But this is basically an illustration of the way they saw the earth and the cosmos. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I believe that this is correct. As you can see here, you have the great deep. The Bible talks about the fountains of the great deep. It talks about the underworld, Sheol, hell, down here. Talks about here's the, the flat plane of the earth surrounded by the ice wall, what we call Antarctica, but it goes all the way around. The rakia, the firmament, or the dome of the sky that creates the open firmament of the heaven here. The firmament itself is called heaven, and then above that are the waters above the firmament, and then the throne of God sits there. Now that's what the Hebrews taught. You can like it, you can not like it, but it's biblical, and I'm going to show you that. 2 Corinthians 12, 1 through 4, well, he's talking about the third heaven. So I want you to see. You know, I know the Greeks and I know some other people have ideas. The Hebrews had ideas of seven heavens. That's not true. Everybody understand that. There's not seven levels to this thing. There are three, and three only, that the Bible teaches. And Paul said here, It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory when I come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth, such an one called up to the third heaven. 
He said, And I knew su such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for man to utter. So Paul talked about three heavens. So again, let me show you something here. And we'll go... Um, just go on through, go on through to uh, slide 17 here. There's, there's another little picture of it. But here's the scripture. This is Genesis 1, 6 through 8. So what we're going we're gonna to cover this real quickly here. But I want you to see something that people miss all the time. It said, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters, and God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. Now look at this right here. And God called the firmament heaven. Everybody say that with me. And God called the firmament heaven. But he also calls what? Where he sits. Heaven. He also calls where we breathe air and the birds fly. Heaven. Why? Because there's three. There's three. Are y'all getting what I'm saying? He called the firmament heaven. So he calls the Shamaim is heaven. But he calls the Rakia heaven. And he calls his throne heaven. Everybody got that? So there's three heavens. Now what we were told, and what I believe for a lot of years too, when I was believing this nonsense about outer space... What I believed was that our atmosphere was the first heaven. Then outer space was the second heaven. And then somewhere out there, way out there, God was hiding in a, the third heaven. It's never been how, you know, how it was. God said, you have the open firmament of heaven where you breathe, where the birds fly, where the clouds are. You have that. Then you have the solid firmament that separated the waters from the waters. Is this what your Bible teaches or is this Pastor D? Exactly. And then above that, you actually, as you're going to see in a minute, the very throne of God sits upon the dome firmament. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew, I believe it's in Matthew 5 or 6, where he said, don't swear by heaven. Why did he say that? He said, don't swear by heaven because it's God's throne. That's why he said heaven is his throne and earth is his. Okay. Let's keep going. Just so you can see the verse, verse 20. God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly and the moving creature that hath life and fowl that they may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. So, there's the open firmament. Everybody say the open firmament. Where the birds fly. The solid firmament. In which are the stars. And supports the water above. And then the, above that is the third heaven. Where God's throne, where he sits. All right. Now let's look at this. Just for anybody who wants to argue out there. There's different words. So we have the word shamayim, which means sky water, heaven. We have the word rakia. Now the word rakia in the Strong's, it says it's the visible arch of the sky, the firmament. It also goes, it talks about uh, to pound the earth, to expand by hammering, to overlay with thin sheets of metal. So it's talking about something that's beaten out thinned out, created like a tent. Now, we have these different Bible versions, and I've shared this with you before, but here's the, the complete Jewish Bible. It says it this way. It says, let there be a dome in the middle of the water and let it divide the water from the water. And God made the dome and divided the water under the dome from the water that is above the dome. And again, you sit there and say, well, Pastor Dean, I just don't believe that. I believe it's some thin little atmosphere that protects us from the vacuum of space. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible's always said there was water above. Or we don't believe anything, the Bible says. 
Because God opened windows of heaven and flooded the earth. It wasn't just rain. He said he opened the windows of heaven and rain and the fountains of the great deep. Three sources of water that he flooded in the days of Noah to flood the earth. Here's a, another Bible version. This is, uh, I can't even remember, the English Bible or something, or Lexham English Bible. God said, let there be a vaulted dome in the midst of the waters and let it cause a separation between the waters. So God made the vaulted dome and he caused a separation between the waters which were under the vaulted dome and between the waters which were over the vaulted dome. And it was so. All right. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it just fun to get back to believe in the Bible and not the world? I say, well, Pastor Dean, I just can't handle that. That's your problem. My job is to tell you what his book says. Genesis uh, 1, 6 and 7 here in the Bible in basic English. I love this one. God said, let there be a solid arch stretching over the waters, parting the waters from the waters. And God made the arch for a division between the waters which were under the arch and those which were over it. Now, I've had people try to tell me that this is just metaphor. This is not real. Folks, God's, did, did real water flood the world? <laughs> real water flooded the world in the days of Noah. So much so God made him make a boat. So it's real water up there. So some people are trying to tell me, no, this arch is just the sky. No, it's not. This arch is much more than the sky because it has to support real water over it. And folks, I don't know about you, but real water is heavy. Pick up a five-gallon bucket of water. Eight pounds per gallon. That's 40 pounds. For our five gallon bucket. All right? Water's heavy. Now, here also, again, remember I said society falls apart if we don't agree on the definition of words and we don't look at it historically. I'm looking at the definition of the Hebrew words and how the Hebrews taught it historically and context and everything else. You can't turn this stuff into metaphors, can't do it. Here's the Brown Driver Briggs. Uh, Lexicon, Hebrew and English lexicon, unabridged. <laughs> Here it is. This is for, this is the definition of the word firmament, rakia. Let's look at it. He says extended surface, solid, solid expanse, beaten out. Um, as base and support, supporting God's throne. The vault of heaven or firmament regarded by the Hebrews as solid and supporting waters above it. And then it gives you all these verses. Okay? Now Christians can disagree with me all they want to, but they're going to have to disagree with what the Bible teaches and the definition of the words and the context and the facts. Right? We're going to have to throw it all out if we don't believe it. Now here's the verse... That I've actually had people argue with this, but uh, you can't really argue with this. It says what it says. Well, that was just Job's friend speaking. I had somebody tell me that. that was just Job's friend speaking. Well, let me tell you, Job's friends, they had more wisdom and revelation. Job and them, they were the wise men of the East. They had more wisdom and revelation than all of us put together. But they're speaking here, and he says this about the sky, which reveals what they believed about it, and I believe what, it is, what was taught in Genesis. He's only telling you what's true here. He says, speaking, he, his friend's rebuking Job, and he's just telling Job, did you, were you, did you help God make the dome? Did you help God do this? Hast thou with him spread out the sky, which is strong as a molten looking glass? This is what the Hebrews believe. We're going back all the way back to the time of Job. Job is believed to be one of the earliest patriarchs and one of the earliest books of the Old Testament. In fact, many believe it was the first, but I believe Enoch was before that. But you see it there. Hast thou with him spread out the sky which is strong as a molten looking glass? Strong, molten. It would have to be strong, folks, to support massive amount of water above it. Would you agree? The Hebrew word for spread out here is raka, which is the root word for rakia. But it means to pound the earth or to expand by hammering, to overlay with thin sheets of metal, 
So even the word gives you the same picture that it's solid, that it's like metal, but it's also like glass. Whatever this thing is, it's tough. Here's a, a picture of somebody hammering metal out into a dome shape. I know the Bible says God has a hammer. Right? The word strong in Hebrew. It says the word strong, guess what? It means strong, hard, bold, harder, stiff. Pretty clear, huh? Not some nebulous, weird atmosphere. The word molten. Here's the word molten. It means to melt or cast as metal, to stiffen or grow hard. So he's, he's even given us how God made it. He, he poured this. He, he molded this. This is something hard. Now here is, if you want to debate me even further about what the Hebrews taught, this is Josephus. The great Jewish historian Josephus, 37 A.D. to past 100 A.D., in book one, chapter one, entitled The Constitution of the World and the Disposition of the Elements, Josephus wrote, And after this, on the second day, he, God, placed the heaven over the whole world and separated it from the other parts, and he determined that it should stand by itself. He also placed a crystalline firmament round it and put together in the manner agreeable to the earth and fitted it for the giving of moisture and rain and for the affording of the advantages of dues. And on the fourth day he adorned the heaven with the sun, moon, and the other stars and appointed them their courses. You see that? The stars, the sun, the moon, he appointed them their courses. Now, here it is for anybody that wants to doubt. We have the waters above. God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Let it divide the waters from the waters. God made the firmament. Divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. So what we have creation scientists. I heard Dr. Carl Ball say this years ago. Well, it was just a vapor canopy of water. And God at the flood condensed that vapor canopy and that water fell down here. And it, but it doesn't exist up there anymore. That's Dr. Carl Ball, creation scientist. But I disagree because you know why I disagree with Dr. Carl Ball? Not because I'm smarter than Dr. Carl Ball. Because the Bible says the waters didn't disappear nor did the solid firmament disappear because the flood was 2500 B.C. In the 600 year of Noah in the second month and the 17th day of the month, the same day where all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. Wait a minute now. If it's just the sky, what are the windows of heaven? Oh, that's just a metaphor, Pastor Dean. That's just poetic. Really? Well, it wasn't flooding before and these windows were open. And all of a sudden, it's flooding water. Well, that wasn't real water up there, Pastor Dean. Well, then you've got to do away with the flood. You've got to do away with it. If you do away with the firmament and the waters above and the waters separating the waters above and the waters below, then you've got to do away with the flood of Noah. But it says, and God remembered Noah, Genesis 8, 1 and 2. God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind passed over the earth and the waters assuaged and uh, the fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven. Now look at this. The fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped and the rain from heaven stopped. Now when you say and, what are you doing? So there's three things, three sources of water. From the windows of heaven, the water above, from the rain, the water within, from the clouds, and from underneath, the waters of the great deep. That's what the Bible says. Believe NASA, believe your Bible. That's all I'm going to say. We know NASA lies, and God is not a man that he should lie. So what do we do with that? Now here's the proof, and this is why I don't agree with Dr. Carl Ball, because the Holy Spirit had the psalmist write, and this was David, 1,000 B.C., so 1,500 years after Noah's flood. 1,500 years, Silas. 1,500 years. Later, the Holy Spirit gives us these two passages in the Psalms. Number one, Psalm 148.4, Praise ye, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. <gasps> the Bible says 
there's waters above the heavens 1,500 years after the flood of Noah. Now, I've made this point before, but again, folks need to see it. Well, here's another passage that I didn't share when I preached this the first time. I found later on, speaking of God, it says, He made darkness His secret place. His pavilion round about Him were dark waters. God's pavilion, meaning what is all around Him, Everybody say it with me. Dark waters. Not Pastor Dean. This is what the Word of God says. And he made darkness his secret place. His pavilion round about him were dark waters and the thick clouds of the skies. Everybody see that? I know it. It's crazy, isn't it? Now let's keep going. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 1. I'm going somewhere with this. Trust me, I know you're saying, Pastor Dean, you told us this before. Well, I don't believe you learned it all the first time, right? So Ezekiel chapter 1, because again, I've had people say again, well, how do we know that, that was a, there's a real solid firmament, dome? How do we know that? Maybe they were, just making, they were just talking. Well, over and over again, you see these witnesses. Here's another witness, Ezekiel. And Ezekiel described what the firmament dome looked like. Now let's read it. He says, this is from Ezekiel chapter 1. Oh goodness, what are we starting at? Verse 21 or so. And he says, when those went, these went, and those stood, and these stood. And when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels that were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. So he's having this vision of these living creatures. And he says, and the likeness of the firmament upon their heads of the living creatures was as the color or the appearance of the terrible crystal which stretched forth over their heads above. So he's saying, he's seeing this, these creatures now upon the earth. And he said, I'm seeing over their heads, and the word color there can mean in the Hebrew appearance. The appearance of this firmament is, in his words, terrible Crystal, exactly what Josephus said, a crystalline firmament. And he says, and under the firmament were their wings straight, and one toward the other, and every one had two. And he, he just goes on to describe these creatures. Look at verse 25. He says, and there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads. There was a voice. And when they stood, they let down their wings. Now he goes on to describe this. Let's go on to verse 26 through 28. He says, and above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne. And as the appearance of a sapphire throne, and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above it. And I saw as the color of amber, and as the appearance of fire round about and within it. From the appearance of his loins even upward, from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about it, and the appearance of the bow, or the rainbow, that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so is the appearance and brightness round about this throne. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord when I saw it, and I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of one that spake. So he's saying, and above the firmament, he saw the firmament above the heads of these angelic creatures and things he was seeing. He saw the firmament above their heads as this terrible crystal. And then he says, above that firmament I saw a throne. And there was one seated upon that throne, and around that throne was a rainbow, and around that throne was fire. Well, this is the same description we get in Daniel chapter 7, Revelation chapter 1. Same description of the throne. He even talks about the rainbow of the bow around the throne. Primarily color it was pushing forth was green. We'll get to that in a second. Everybody see that? Now when you see that, you understand this verse a little better. Isaiah 40, 22. This is the one where the people that still brainwashed by the globe believe. This is the one they say is, talks to, oh, the Bible says it's the globe. No. He sits on the circle. Circle. Not ball. He says it is he, speaking of God, that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. And the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretch. 
that stretches out the heavens as a curtain, and he spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. So God is saying that he sits upon this. Now, what did Ezekiel just tell us? He said, I saw this firmament, this terrible crystal, and right above it I saw a sapphire throne, and I saw God seated upon that throne. Literally, God says, God, this thing, God stretched out. He made a tent for us to live in. Everybody say tent. tent. Have you ever seen a ball tent? Maybe for a hamster. Not for us. Right? Pretty powerful. Let's look at this. This is interesting. I don't tend to like the NIV, but this was an interesting way to phrase this, and they're correct here in this passage. But they say it is he, or he sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. Meaning he look, that God is literally sitting up there and looking down at us, and we, he can see us as the little grasshoppers running around. Because he's, he's seated high and looking through the glass at us. In fact, one of the words in Hebrew, in the, you break it down, and it talks about it's the, each letter is about the shepherd, the great shepherd looking at us through the glass windows. It's amazing. Um, now let's go to Revelation 4, 1 through 6. Say, Pastor Dean's teaching the Bible, not scientism, not NASA's gospel, not the world's gospel, the word of God. Now here's what Revelation 4, 1 through 6 says. Y'all need to pay attention to this. And after this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet talking with me. He said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must... Uh, be hereafter and immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne was set in heaven and one set upon the throne and he that sat upon was to look at his jasper and sardine stone and there was a rainbow around the throne the sight like unto an emerald what color is an emerald there is a glorious rainbow around the throne primarily emerald green just remember that and around about the throne were the four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now let me ask you something. Does that sound exactly like what Ezekiel was describing in Ezekiel 1? I saw this throne in heaven. I saw this fire upon it. I saw this rainbow around it. And then he says here, and before the throne, meaning in front of it, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. Folks, your Bible says the throne of God sits upon this sea of glass. See, to him, to this thing, we look up and see through a glass darkly, as Paul said. He looks down through it. It's our ceiling. It's his floor. The crystal, the firmament, the sea of glass is the floor of heaven. He said, in the midst of the throne, around about the throne, were the four beasts full of eyes. And this is part of what Ezekiel was seeing as well. All right, let's keep going. Revelation 15, 1 through 4. Y'all learning something? Your Bible fits together like pieces of a puzzle. They just have to be put together. Once you put the Bible together, God did it that way. He scattered pieces of truth about different things all throughout the Bible. And our job is to find those pieces and put them together and make the whole picture. That's why it talks about rightly dividing the word. Put it all together correctly. Now, Revelation 15. He said, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. Can you imagine that God's throne has this fire burning around him and it has this massive rainbow emerald green and that in front of him is this crystal glass and can you imagine what the fire and the rainbow and all that looks like reflecting off of that glass? Beautiful. You know, impressive. I mean, that's, that's the, 
much better than walking into the Oval Office. You know what I mean? He says, I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name. Look at what? Stand on the sea of glass. People who made it to heaven, who overcame the mark of the beast, who made it into heaven, where are they standing? On the glass. They're standing on it, having harps of God, and they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all the nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. The song of Moses, the song of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. They stand upon the sea of glass. I have come to believe that the firmament truly is the key. It's what seals the deal, at least for me anyway, in more ways than one. Unquestionably, the thing is hard, Job 37, 18. Firm, Proverbs 8, 28. Supporting the waters above, Genesis 1, 6 through 8. Psalm 148, 4. Attached to the earth, Amos 9, 6. Within which Yahuwah placed the sun, moon, and stars, Genesis 1, 14 through 19, and Psalm 19, 1 through 6 and upon which his throne sits, Ezekiel 126, Isaiah 66, 1. Clearly, this is a very important issue to Yahuwah, the firmament. It, de it declares his handiwork, Psalm 19, 1. The only model that accommodates every aspect of the firmament is the circular enclosed world model. The only way around this is to grossly misrepresent the scriptures, yanking the true meanings of the words out of context and fantasize about definitions for those words which are not even remotely supported by the text or the historical context in which the scriptures were written. Now let's look at this. When you understand the truth, this is the way it is, folks. The earth is a flat disk. Now we're looking down on it as if we were sitting at the top of the dome here. The North Pole is the only magnetic center. We're going to talk about that here pretty soon. Getting closer. The mountain of God is there. Directly above Polaris, the throne of God. I believe Polaris is marking where the throne is. Sun and the moon move around us. Antarctica is the ice wall. No matter where you go here, you can circumnavigate the world going this way because your compass is always going to port but point back to the north. So as you go this way to the west, it's always going to point you back. People go, How? whoa, it's got to be a ball because the people have made it around the world. Well, folks, I don't know what the deal is. You can, you can go around the ball or you can go around the dish. I don't know what the big confusion is about, right? But see, when you realize this, that right up here, the throne of God sits, it makes something else very interesting. It's called the Aurora Borealis. Now this is directly from the Aurora forecast. But I, I, I found it interesting that if the throne of God is, is seated above this dome here, at the center, the high point, and it says that there is an emerald rainbow around the throne this is a direct picture of what they say the aurora was doing it's almost a complete circle all the way around above the north pole and it just happens to be for the most part green here's a picture of it so well pastor dean why can they see it sometimes in the southern you know at the antarctica you want me to tell you why because it starts at the top of the dome. As the dome moves out, it radiates out, and then you can't see it. And then it goes down, and by the time it reaches the bottom, you can see it. I saw a girl who said she, she saw for the first time in her life when she saw this was not a Christian. She was not born again. She was not saved. She looked up, and she, was, she saw the aurora. And she said, I just started weeping and fell to my knees. I believe it's a manifestation of the glory of God. They give us all this bull crap about the sun and uh, 
just happens to be green. And you know, folks, and the writers of the, uh, the, writers of the New Testament and the, the, the Hebrew prophet Ezekiel and the writer, you know, the apostle John, guess what? They never went to the North Pole. How would they know to say? The Bible talks about heaven being in the sides of the north. Remember, remember in, uh, in Isaiah 14, Lucifer said when he said, look, he said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. He said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. The north has always been identified with where heaven is. That's another sermon coming. But let's look at this. I want to I get to where we're going, and I'm, I'm going to get through this as quickly as possible. Genesis 1, 16 and 17. Now, everybody, please stay with me on this, because now we're going to, we talked a little bit about the dome, the throne of God. And we're going to talk about the day the sky falls, the stars fall, the powers of heaven being shaken. None of this makes sense in a Copernican heliocentric cosmology. None of it. Now, here's what God made, folks. We know God said he made the heavens and the earth. And then he says what he made within that. He said, God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, the sun and the moon. And look, and he made the stars also. And he set them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. So, the stars are not hundreds of billions of light years away. They can't be. Nor are they these massive suns. But does it say anything here about God making planets? No, but we'll come back to that in a second. Let's look at these verses. These are the verses surrounding... And remember, surrounding the second coming of Jesus Christ, what's going to happen in the heavens? And here's what it says. And if you have a hard time reading, this is Matthew 24, 29 through 30. We read it last week. This is also showing you when the, the, that the, after the tribulation is when the rapture takes place. It's at the second coming of Jesus. I covered all that. But Matthew 24, 29 says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven. Now, folks, people say, oh, that's meteors, that's asteroids, that's not really the stars. Well, really? God didn't say he made meteors and asteroids. Is a meteor or asteroid a star? Well, modern science would tell you no, it's not. So are we making God out to be a liar if we say meteors and asteroids are the stars that are going to fall? Or is it literally going to be the stars, as Jesus said? Mark 13, 25. Well, let me keep reading. He says, the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Everybody remember that term, the powers of heaven. That's always, I've always wondered what in the world he was talking about, but now I know. But the powers of heaven, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, for they shall see the Son of Man, Jesus, coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now Mark 13, 25 says it similarly. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. All right, now let's look at this. Let's go on. Here's Luke 21. And Revelation 6, 13, just going to read them to you here. Luke 21 says it again, and there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars. Why does he say planets? I know, well, we got a smart addict out there, I'm sure it's going to say, but there, the King James uses the word planet one time. Yeah, I'm going to show you what that says. All right. But it never says it here. It never says God made anything. It's sun, moon, and stars. And look at Revelation 6, 13. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Now God made the earth, he made the sun, he made the moon, he made the stars, period. There is nothing in the Bible about a fifth thing 
in creation called a planet. And even one time, even the one time, the word planet is used in the King James Version, 2 Kings 23, 5. The Hebrew word is mazalah. And that means constellation of stars or the zodiac. Read Genesis 1 and show me any mention of Yahuwah creating planets. It's not there. What you see is earth created first and the sun, moon, and stars created to serve it. Heliocentricity is totally foreign to the biblical narrative of the cosmos. And what we call planets are the wandering stars of Jude, which are reserved for judgment. Why would rocks need to be judged? If planets are what we're told there, now hear me out here. I'm not saying the planets don't exist. I'm saying the way we understand them is inaccurate according to the scriptures. I've had telescopes. I've looked at them. I've seen them. I've seen the rings. I've seen the moons. I've seen all that stuff. Yeah, there's something out there. But these are things, wandering stars, according to Jude, that are reserved for judgment. Again, why would rocks need to be judged? Planets as we know them exist nowhere in Scripture, not even in 2 Kings 23.5. Those of you who are of the King James only mindset, if you go read 2 Kings 23.5 and compare translations, you'll see over and over and over again at the latter part of the verse, I don't know if you guys can read it, it's kind of small up there, it's talking about people who are worshiping Baal and uh, the sun, the moon, and the constellations is what it says in multiple translations. King James is not the only one that chooses the word planets. Um, but as you see here, all these other ones are using the word constellations because that's more appropriate. King James says planets. If you look up the word, it's Mazaloth. The word that we also hear is Mazaroth. That's the constellations, or that's what we would refer to perhaps as the 12 signs of the zodiac. It's not referring to planets. Again, that's in Strong's Concordance. It's Brown Driver's Brig, also the, the Jacinius, same things, talking about zodiac. What else was placed inside the firmament? Let's continue. Genesis 1, 14. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Do you see planets anywhere in that narrative? He's telling you everything that he created. And if planets are what we are told they are, why did he leave that out? Now you say, well, you're making an argument for si for, from silence, Rob. I'm saying, no, you are. If you believe planets are what we're told they are, then you are waging an argument from silence. Because it's not there. He told us what he created and, he, and where he put them. Where did he put them? In the firmament. i got to be honest with you, that's where I got stuck. Because I was studying this out. I used to teach the Kent Hovind, Carl Baugh model of the ice canopy. Have you guys heard that theory? The Earth had a canopy of ice around it. That was the firmament. And then something hit it, maybe a comet or whatever. I used to teach this myself. Uh, and it disintegrated over 40 days, 40 nights, raining down on the Earth. And it destroyed the, the firmament above. Uh, well, you know, I mean, I'm going to go back to what does the text actually say? And what did you hear with all this stuff? It says he put the sun, moon, and stars in the firmament, not outside and around it, which is what the Carl Baugh Kent Hovind model requires. you got an earth surrounded by a canopy of ice and the sun, moon, and stars outside it. It doesn't work. What does the text say? Did any of you hear anything about planets? Yes or no? Was the sun ever described as a star? Yes, was it? Were the stars ever described as suns? Paul later says that there's one glory for like the, the heavenly bodies and one for you know fish and birds and stuff like that. That God specifically um, he gives definitions for these things, and everything has its own. It's its own thing. It's its own kind. The sun is a greater light. The moon is a greater light. Right, and he never says the sun is described as stars. Never says stars are described as suns. So, was the moon described as a reflector of light or a light of its own? Lesser light. Was there any mention of galaxies? 
That's an interesting study. I wish I had time to unpack that as to where we came up with galaxy. And it's also kind of funny because the word galaxy comes from a, it's a French word as I understand it, that means Milky Way. So when we say the Milky Way galaxy, we're being redundant. <laughs> the Milky Way, Milky Way. And when you look at Edwin Hubble and why he came up with the term, he changed what used to be known as nebula, spirally things that you look through a telescope, and he decided that, no, those are galaxies. He made it up. He said, those are galaxies. And then he said, and that streak that we see that we call the Milky Way is just an arm because we must be in a galaxy that looks just like those. And it came from a guy who refused to acknowledge the biblical narrative of centrality, that we are the central focus. He used words like terror and horror at the prospect of that. He's the guy that gave us galaxies. Would you consider the text to be describing a heliocentric or geocentric model after what you read? Were the sun, moon, and stars placed inside or outside of it? Again, inside. Okay, just checking. Just making sure that I'm not crazy here. What the modern science calls the planet, the book of Jude and the book of Enoch call them wandering stars who did not stay on the course God set for them. They rebelled. Remember, Jesus said the stars would fall to earth at his second coming. So stars cannot be massive suns that the scientists say. And folks, I'm telling you, this is what they might. They're trying to tell us what they think they are. See, this, this guy right here, Neil deGrasse Tyson, he mocks the Bible about this issue. Now, I feel sorry for this man because he is deceived. I believe he's a high-level Freemason, Illuminati occultist anyway. He's just a spokesperson for this whole lie. But here's what he says. He says, you know, one of the signs of that second coming is that the stars will fall out of the sky and land on the earth. To even write that means you don't know what those things are. You have no concept of what the actual universe is. But you don't either. Has he been out to one of these stars? No. See, here's what it comes down to, folks. You're going to believe the world's religion of scientism and the things that they just make up and tell you that they can't even know. Or you're going to believe God's word. It's really what it comes down to. And how do we reconcile some of these scriptures? Like uh, where it talks about in Isaiah 34 that all the hosts of heaven, how many? All. Shall be dissolved and the heavens shall roll together as a scroll and all their hosts shall fall down. The hosts of heaven, stars are going to fall. How many of them? Oh. Isaiah said that. Peter said that the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. John said the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. Keep going. We say we have Yeshua himself, the son of God, the creator saying the stars shall fall from heaven. And we know that Yeshua, did Yeshua ever contradict any of the prophets? So when he says the stars, how many do you think he's talking about? If he's supporting the prophets, he means all. Again in Mark 13, Revelation 6, 13, John says, And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, and also one-third of the stars we see being dragged down by the, by the dragon. Now you might be able to look at Revelation 12 and say that's allegorical. Dragon, you know, being the allegory or the symbol for Satan. Okay, but you still have Isaiah, Yeshua, the Son of God himself, Peter and John. Would you agree these are pretty big heavy hitters in Scripture? The Son of God himself, the Creator. They just told you that all the stars are going to fall to earth. So do you still think that the stars are what we've been taught they are? I don't. <laughs> now, are you still taking the Bible literally? Or are you going to do an amazing tack dance for all of us to justify why you're not going to do so? Oh, it's metaphor. It's poetry. All the stars are going to fall to earth. There's no indication that any of these guys are speaking in poetic language. They just made a statement of fact. So that means this can't be what we are told that it is. Billions of suns with planets going around them. And there are billions of those allegedly out there as well. Because if this cosmological worldview is true, then forget about terrorism and the Antichrist. We've got a much bigger problem if Beetlejuice is headed our way. Never mind Andromeda 
and all these billions of other galaxies. I didn't say this. I made the statement that I believe that this, I stand alone on the word of God, right? B-I-B-L-E. When I was a kid, I used to say, blee oh, blee oh, blee Kind of making fun of it because I thought the songs were stupid as a kid. Now I'm standing on it now. Because there's a deception coming. It may already be here. I would contend it, it is already here. And it's just going to get worse. So again, if this is the only compass I have in a sea of lies, this is what I'm going to stand on. Which means that can't be what they're telling me it is in my science class. And with all due respect, what's, what Ken Hovind and others are telling me it is, because they're agreeing with the science class. He said, and so everybody who tried to make proclamations about the physical universe based on Bible passages got the wrong answer. See, this is the battle of our time. And I'm telling you, this is why the flat earth revelation is taking Christianity and the world by storm right now. And it's only going to get bigger. Because we have two opposing views of creation itself. And this is a man who says there is no God. And my Bible says the man that says there is no God is a fool. And it says in Romans 1 that the men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness about creation who claim themselves to be wise have become fools. No, no. The Bible got it right, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and NASA, a bunch of liars, and the European Space Agency, and Copernicus, and all the rest of them got it wrong. God's right. And all the prophecies that are coming to pass concerning the second coming of Jesus Christ is leading us to the truth. Mathematically, there is no way you could get all the specific prophecies of Jesus' first coming and the second coming and all the ones that have been fulfilled and are being fulfilled now. There's no way you do that with just a book written by men who didn't know what they were talking about. I would almost play that clip from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, but it might not be appropriate for Sunday morning. Let's look at the term powers of heaven here. Woo, I'm feeling good right now. Powers of heaven. Remember it says, we read it in, in Matthew 24, Mark 13. The powers of heaven shall be shaken. That always, I always wonder, what is he talking about? Because if you're just talking about the first heaven, what, clouds? Some rain? I mean, what's in the, the, the first heaven? Air? No, he's talking about the second one, the firmament. Oh, why do I know that? The word powers in this phrase, the powers of heaven, is the word, Greek word dunamis. It is where we get force, the miraculous power, a miracle, ability, abundance, power, strength. Now get this, Psalm 150 verse 1 says this, Praise ye the Lord, Yahweh. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. So when it says the powers of heaven will be shaken, what is happening at the second coming of Jesus Christ is he's literally going to begin to crack and break up and roll back this solid sky. And the stars are going to be shaken off of it like a tree. Like figs off a tree. And they're going to start falling. Boom, boom, boom. And the Bible talks about in Revelation 18, these hailstones coming down. These massive stones coming down that weigh hundreds of pounds, raining upon mankind to bring the judgment. It's going to be the firmament breaking up and coming down upon us it is solid my friend and God says he says the firmament is the demonstration of his power it's one of the strongest most awesome things he's ever made and he says that power of heaven will be shaken 
In fact, it says it's going to be broken up, dissolved, rolled back, and fall down. And when that happens, when the sky falls, everyone will see the throne and they will see Jesus preparing to come and they will be in terror because they have blasphemed him and mocked him and not believed him and not surrendered to his great love and his sacrifice on the cross for their sins and believed his word that is all evident all around them. In fact, he says that men could, should be able to look at creation, the things invisible and the things visible. And he said because of creation, men will be without excuse on the day of judgment. There will be no excuse. Mouths, all mouths will be shut. Jesus will return to be King of kings and Lord of lords. Isaiah 34 Verse 4, all the host of heaven shall be dissolved and the heaven shall be rolled together or apart like a scroll. That word rolled there, galel, can mean rolled together, rolled apart. It doesn't matter. It just means rolled out of the way. The heavens will be rolled as a scroll and all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falleth off the vine and as the falling fig from the fig tree. Dissolved in the strongs means to, to flow, to dwindle, to vanish, to consume away. Rolled there, galel, means to roll. And it can mean to roll together, to roll away, to roll down. Revelation 6, 14. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and every island were moved out of their places. Heaven's going to be rolled. How can that just be some little atmosphere? And what happened if God rolled a big hole in the atmosphere? Wouldn't the empty vacuum of space suck out all our oxygen and we all die? It's ridiculous, folks. There is a solid dome over this earth. It is flat. There is heaven above and there is hell beneath. That's your Bible. Oh, don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. And on the day of the second coming, the sky, the solid sky is going to be broken up and dissolved and melted and some of it's going to fall but it's going to be rolled back and the heaven itself, the firmament, the rakia will be opened and they will see the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There's no surprise rapture. The heavens shall pass away. Let's read this, 2 Peter 3, 7 through 12. We're almost at the end, folks. The heavens shall pass away. This is 2 Peter 3, 7 through 12. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us who are not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation, behavior, and godliness, looking for and hastening unto the coming day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved? Is that God's heaven? No. Is that our atmosphere? No, because we'll all still be breathing air. That firmament heaven is going to dissolve and burn and fall. It's going to be that hell. That's going to come down and destroy all the cities of the nations on the day of God, the great day of God's wrath and judgment at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Man, I don't know about y'all. The word dissolve here in this passage in Peter, it means to the heavens will be loosened. They will break up. They will be destroyed. This, this ferment, it'll dissolve. It'll melt. It'll be put off. You know what, you know what that means? The earth will see heaven. The whole earth will see him. That's why it says every eye will see him. That would be impossible on a ball, folks. Poor Australians would never get to see it.
No, when he cracks open the heavens in the north, right there above Polaris, and peels it back, every eye will see the one who with the pierced hands and the pierced feet. The word dissolved in the Strong's. I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. It means to break, wreck, crack. Everybody hear that? Everybody remember that. Break, wreck, crack. Right? Everybody say the sky will crack open. And reveal Jesus. Let me give you the words. Here's a, here's a passage for you. Revelation 19, 11. I'm trying to do it quick. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. The Lord Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Listen to this. When he will be revealed from heaven. The word revealed in the Strong's Greek dictionary means he will be disclosed, he will appear, he will be manifested. If you take the de definition even further, it means to take off the cover. What is covering Jesus from us now? What is covering us from seeing him in the heaven, seated upon his throne? The firmament. When that's moved out of the way, it's like, you know what it is? The whole world's going to, it says the sun's going to go dark, the moon's going to go dark. You ever been to a play? They turn out all the lights right before the Peel the curtain open. Before Jesus comes, he goes, turn all the lights off. And then the curtain's going to open. That curtain is the sky. The solid dome firmament is going to peel open. I said, what is being removed to unveil Jesus Christ at his second coming? Revelation 1, 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. There are going to be some that are going to be joyful and happy and thrilled at his coming. There are going to be most that are going to wail and weep and mourn and grieve. Now let me finish with this. The satanic elite are preparing for war. The Illuminati, the Satanist, the world system, the Antichrist, system. They're preparing to fight Jesus Christ at his return. How do I know that? Revelation 17, 12 through 14. And the ten horns which thou sawest, and the ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind. They're all unified, and this is their purpose. You, do, you make no doubt about it. The Luciferians, the Satanists, the people that I've talked to, the people that I've studied what they say, they understand they look at Jesus. They look at our God, Yahweh, Jehovah, Elohim, Yeshua, Hamashiach, the Lord Jesus Christ. They look at him as the enemy. And they look at Lucifer as God, the one who's going to save them and help them and, and be with them to fight him when he comes back. Listen, the true Luciferian, Satanist, Illuminati, and all these people, they know Jesus is coming back. They believe it more than a bunch of some Christians I know. And everything they're doing is to prepare for this war, this fight. Almost every day I go, what am I doing? What am I doing? Look, I'll tell you what I'm doing. You know, what was the advice of Gamaliel? Remember what Gamaliel said? He said, look, if this is of man, it'll fall away by itself. If it's of God, then you risk being at war with God. Why don't you pray that about this issue? Because if it's just the raving, you know, rantings of a lunatic from Texas or a bunch of other people who believe the same way, it's going to fall away by itself. There's a reason why this is growing rapidly, almost the same pace that the quote-unquote Hebrew Roots Movement started in 2009. This is volume one of handwritten letters of testimony from people, many from atheists. Are you going to argue with this? Are you going to say this is a distraction? Let's compare fruit baskets. I dare you. Let's compare fruit baskets. Critics. Okay? How many people have written you letters like this based on the standard cosmological worldview that you're pushing? These are testimonies from people. How many of you uh, maybe are here because of this issue? Anybody? 
two people in this room are here to listen, not just to me. I mean, I thought I was going to focus on the Ephraim Awakening more, but then I looked at the other panel of speakers. I said, you know what? They've got that covered. And I really wrestled with it talking about this again. I, I, every day I wake up and say, God, I'm done. I'm, I, I'm not going to talk about this anymore. I'm like Jeremiah. I get it. You know, that dude, we had to preach a message that nobody was going to receive. And he knew it. We had to preach it anyway. And every time I say I'm done, I get another letter. I get another phone call. I get another email, another Facebook message. Somebody, an atheist or a Christian that went away because science taught them the monkey man science. And they've tossed their faith. Coming back. You know, if we're to be known by our fruits, this is good fruit. This is volume one. I've got several other volumes. I'm not saying this to brag. I'm just showing you the evidence. To all you people out there who think this is not important, to all you people who think that this is a distraction, taking people away from God, taking away from the gospel, taking, you know, you know what? This is drawing so many people, it's unbelievable. The people who went away from the gospel went there because they were taught that the spinning heliocentric globular earth model, and they realized my Bible is a flat earth book because they're being more honest than most Christians are. And they said, you know what? I'm going to believe science. And then when you turn around and show them, you know, science is full of it. And they're telling you they're full of it. The other day, just a couple days ago, I was ready to throw a towel again. This is a regular thing for you. Get out, Sheila. I'm like, I'm done. I'm done. Forget it. I'm done. Ask Brother Steve back there because he's talked me down a few times. You know, help me out. You know, this is the path that for whatever reason God has put me on. You know, I can't help it. I didn't ask for it. I've been praying every day. And every time I want to give up, I get another testimony that comes in and says, don't do that. So I keep going. Science says the universe came about from a big bang. The Bible says it all in one universe. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Science says the stars, including our sun, came first. The Bible says the sun and stars didn't show up until day four, after earth was created and already producing life. Science describes a solar system with planets going around a fixed sun. The Bible describes an earth-based system with the sun, moon, and stars moving over it. Science says the earth is spinning at 1,000 miles per hour and orbiting the sun at 67,000 miles per hour. The Bible says in about 67 places that the sun, moon, and stars are moving, but never says anything about the earth moving. Rather, we consistently find that the earth is fixed and unmovable, set on a firm foundation of pillars. Science tells us the universe came into being nearly 14 billion years ago and that the earth is about 4.5 billion years old. The Bible tells us it all began less than 6,000 years ago. Science tells us that humans arrived on this earth, as Kent Hovind would say, from goo to you by way of the zoo. The Bible says that we were divinely created in the image and likeness of Yahuwah. Science tells us we are on a spinning heliocentric globe in an average galaxy among billions of galaxies in an ever-expanding universe. The Bible tells us we are on a still flat earth that was inscribed as a circle into something with four corners set on pillars under a dome within which the sun, moon, and stars were placed on day four. So who should we believe, science or the Bible? I'm going with the Bible. Thank you. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video presentation. If you did, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, like the video, and share it on your favorite social media sites. There's a lot more to come, so stay tuned, and we'll see you back next time.